during this play reading, I'd like to explain to you a little bit about what it is. Uh, the Guerrilla Theater sponsors a playwriting competition, and they pick the top three plays and ask them to uh, submit the plays. And the top three that they pick are read then for audiences who hopefully enjoy them. And from those three, a play will be picked and the one that's chosen, the one that wins the playwriting competition, will be produced next year by Guerrilla Theater. Uh, do you want to tell them when this year's play is being produced? Yeah. Uh, this year's play is BYOB by Tom Lavagino. Uh, being read tonight. Tomorrow night we're going to read The Ritual by David Hansen, who lives in Shawnee, at the 45th Street Coffee House. And uh, next Tuesday, at Planet Cafe, we're going to read uh, To Die for One of Lobster by Cato McNichol. Um, this weekend, Friday and Saturday night, we are going to do a full production of last year's winning play, Death as Usual. Um, and that starts at 8 o'clock at the Ape House, 517 East 18th Street, uh, downtown. And uh, all of these events are free. Uh, this is called BYOB by Tom Lavignino. Um, I should warn you that it's got some adult themes and the language may be a little rough, so be aware. I'd like to introduce the actors now. Playing B. St. Jacques, who's a psychiatrist, is Sarah Kalovich. Playing Joan Lansenkamp, who is a patient, is Jennifer Benskin. Playing Roderick Champlain, who's a kid, is Danny Shaw. Playing Jesse Madrazo, who's a professional hockey player, is Justin Kennedy. And playing the sports agent of Jesse Madrazo is Scott Holloway. And I'll be reading the stage directions that are necessary. This is BYOB by Tom Lavignino. The script starts with a little quote that the author thinks it enlightens the piece, so I'm going to read it to you. Life, my dear Commodore, is never funny. It's grim. It's there every morning, breathing in your face, the moment you open your red baggy eyes. Life, Mr. Rosebob, is a husband hanging from a hook in the closet. Open the door too quickly and your whole day is shot. But open the door just a little way, sneak your hand in, pull out your dress, and your day's made. Arthur Coppett from Oh Dad, Poor Dad, Mama's Hung in the Closet, and I'm feeling so sad. As the play opens, we hear Patsy Cline's recording of Sweet Dreams. The lyric gets stuck on the line, You don't love me, it's play. And keeps repeating, You don't love me, it's play. And then we see 14 year old Roderick Champlain. Scene one. Blackout. Scene two. This is the psychiatric office of B. St. Jacques. With her is her patient, Joan Lansing here. So now, this latest thing is, this latest bombshell he drops, is he's taken in this woman. This woman's living with him now, in this house where he lives with other people. Well, his roommates, right. Two other people. It's a three-bedroom place, real small. It's not really that small. I, I, I mean, it's a big house, but that's what he always says. It's too small. That's why he never wanted to move in with him. He always said it was too small. There's only two bathrooms. And if there's ever... Uh, well, where does she sleep? Where does she sleep? This woman. On the couch, he says. When did she move in? A week and a half. Two weeks ago? Maybe three weeks ago. Is she an old friend of his, or...? Well, well that's the thing. That, that's the thing. He doesn't know her at all. In fact, the latest bombshell. Are you ready for this? Not only does he not know her, not only does he not know her, but she's a homeless person. She's homeless? Yeah, I, I mean, she's homeless. She's like a bad lady. He took in a homeless person? Yeah, a bad lady. A freaking bad lady. Have you met her? Yes, I've met her. She's a bad lady. What does she look like? What does she look like? What do you think she looks like? She's a bad lady. 
She doesn't bathe. Well, I, I mean, she took a bath. I guess she took a bath. There are two bathrooms in that house. So you saw her after she took a bath? What did she look like after she took a bath? That's what you're trying to know. Come on, Joan. She's not that good looking. Joan. She's not that good looking. She's not. She's an attractive woman, physically attractive. She's a bad lady. She's a bum off the street, and he's sleeping with her probably. He must be. Why else would she be there? Why else do you have somebody living with you in your house? What does he have to say about it? What does? Oh, he. He says he's just helping her out until she can get back on her feet. Okay. He's just playing Good Samaritan for a change, he says, to make up for all the bad stuff he pulled on other people. She just needs to get back on her feet, is what he says. And what does he say about you two? About me and him? What do you mean? You said he told you that he loved you. Nine times. Okay. And that doesn't count the times he told me twice in one day, or three or four or more times in one day. What okay, okay, Joe. Uh, has he told you since she's moved in? Once. About a month and a half ago, I think. I mean, we're still together, him and me. I'm still his girlfriend. That's what he still says to people. Well, what do you say? What do I say about this bag lady? What do you say about you and him, John? What do you mean, what do I say about me and him? Do you still love him? Well, yeah, sure. Sure, I love him. But he doesn't love you as much as you love him. I don't know, maybe he does. How many times have you told him you loved him? I don't know. I mean, I can't count that high. Uh, I'll bet it's been a lot more than nine times. Yeah. So even using something as shallow as that, as the number of times you each said you loved each other, I mean, which doesn't even mean anything necessarily, you are imbalanced. Well, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. It's not good to have imbalance in any kind of interpersonal relationship. You say that all the time. Uh, because it bears repeating. Because it's true. But wait, now don't stop me. I know I told you this before, but don't stop me. I want you to listen. If you have a relationship with someone, let's say it's your, your mailman. You say hello to him every morning and he says hello back and that's all. Okay, he's not looking for an involved relationship with you. And you are not looking for an involved relationship with him. He just wants to say hello if he sees you, and that's all he wants from you. And you just want to say hello you see him. That's all you want from him, isn't that right? Well, and my mail. Yeah, okay, and, and your mail, um, of course. But uh, if you accept that this is the extent of your relationship with him, and if he accepts that this is his extent of his relationship with you, accepts and is content that this is the extent of your relationship, well then it's a successful relationship. Because it's balanced. Exactly. It's when there's imbalance that there's a problem. I know. You sound imbalanced with your boyfriend. Maybe, maybe so. I don't know. You are. If he doesn't grant you precisely the same emotional weight that you grant him. Well, maybe he does. I don't know if he does. But what am I supposed to do if oh, he does? Oh, okay, okay. Now, see, what you have to ask yourself is, do you want to maintain a relationship with this man? Yeah, if it's a real relationship. You don't want to be just friends. Nope. Okay. All right, Jim. Then you've got two choices. You either have to get out of the relationship or convince him to balance it. Convince him to love me as much as I love him. Exactly. Oh boy. It's work. It's process. It's life. But you do it. See, you can't not do it if you want to balance. Your heart tells you that it's it. But this thing, it's almost a year now that I've been doing that already. Trying to do that with this okay, guy. Okay, okay, okay. Now think about this. Consider this. You haven't been trying the right way. I don't know, doctor. Oh, you know. You've just got to find the right way. But I don't even know where to start. <laughs> you know, 
You've got it easy, actually. I don't got it easy. Not with a bag lady in the house. <laughs> no! See, you've got it easy. You do. I'll give you a difficult one. A difficult example, I mean, to show you just how easy you've got it. Okay, let's, let's say you loved somebody, like, um, Jesse Madrazo. I mean, I mean, you don't really love him, but let's just say uh, as an example that you do. Okay, um, so you love him. Now, uh, he doesn't know who you are. He doesn't even know that you're alive. He doesn't care that you're alive. You watch him on TV every time he has a game, and you got cable just to watch him. And what you've got to do, the work you've got to do if you want to find balance with him, if you want him to love you as much as you love him, is first is first to contact him you know, somehow, uh, obviously. That would be the first thing you would do. If you see him on TV, you know, auctioning himself off for charity, have dinner with Jesse Madrazo, well, you see, you would make a bid, of course. And if you missed the auction entirely, I mean, if you didn't even know about the auction until after the fact, you would, you would call the organization, the charity organization, to track down the winning bidder somehow, to make a deal with him, to get that dinner for yourself. And if that didn't work, you'd have to find some other way to get this to the person you love to get to place with him where you can show him you, your beautiful you. You've got to make him want you. You've got to make him love you as much as you love him. It is work. It is process. It is life. And that is all that I mean. That is all that I am saying when I say that you have it easy. You see, you can call your boyfriend on the phone. You already have a tangible relationship with him. All you have to do is get it balanced. You just have to maneuver him into balance. You might have to force it. You might have to make an ultimatum. You either tell him it's her or you. You either get this homeless woman out of your house or you lose me entirely forever. You might have to say that to him. It's called work. It's called process. It's called life. Who's Jesse Madrazo? <laughs> Blackout. Scene three. This is the sports agent office of Stephen Crawl. I had the crappiest car in high school. <laughs> well, who didn't? Uh, but what a radio. What <laughs> a great radio. I'll never forget one night flipping around, hearing American Pie playing three different stations at the same time. See? That's exactly what I'm talking about, man. What? Th that's exactly what I mean about our problem. Jesse, we don't have any problem. You're in a fog. A uh, fog. The 60s were a fog. For you and everybody else in it. And now you can't freaking get out of it. Really? Fogginess caused details, see? And details is everything. I don't have any details. That's right. That's right. I mean, look at the music you listen to. American Pie? <laughs> Drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. Then good old boys drinking whiskey and rye? <sighs> well, okay, fine. But what model Chevy? What color was it? What kind of whiskey? It's a song, Jesse. Yeah, well... At least Springsteen talks about the model. At least Jimmy Buffett specified margaritas. <laughs> You're very fun. I just want some detail out of you, man. It's not so much to ask. You want detail out of me. I want to know what's happening with the skate thing, in detail. Nothing is happening with the skate thing. When do you want to start working? <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> hey, uh, listen to me. Uh, man. you listen. You work for me. No. I don't. We have a contract, Jesse. The contract's out the window if you fight me. <laughs> Nobody's fighting you. <laughs> you don't fight me. What was Friday? What? The, the TV thing? What was that? <laughs> How was I supposed to know they put a camera on me? Because you're not stupid. But I was sitting in the box. And they're paying you to do it. They're paying you a hundred and twenty-five grand this season to do it. You ought to be able to sit in a box like a professional. Sit in the box like a professional? 
What the heck are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. We've talked about this, Jesse. We've talked about the guy sitting at home, watching on TV. He doesn't want to see you sitting in the box in the first place with a cast on your leg. I was hurt. You, you should have acted like it. You should have just smiled at the camera. <laughs> That's what I did. Yeah, after you pulled your pants leg up. After you showed the whole world the cast with the dollar signs plastered all over it. I didn't put those on there. How's the guy at home supposed to know that? How's he supposed to give a crap? Because he's the guy buying tickets to your game, you schmuck. If he's buying tickets to the game, what the heck he's doing at home watching it? Because he's sick of your crap. Hey, Steven, Steven, it's my rep. Yeah, I forgot. You're Jesse Madrazo. You're supposed to be an idiot. I'm supposed to be tough. Well, it's not playing like that. It's playing like you're an idiot. No, it's not. Yes, it is. If I'm such an idiot, how come I'm on the freaking United Way committee? Your name is on the masthead of a stupid letter to raise money. It doesn't mean Jack. Then why'd you have me do it? To keep people from thinking that you're an idiot. But you still pe say people think I'm an idiot. And you say people think you're not. That's right, I'm not. But you are. That's what everybody thinks. If that's what everybody thinks, why do you have my name put on that frickin' letter? Why do you have me auction myself off? You auctioned yourself off and you never followed through with it. I... You never went on the dinner with the guy. I called the guy. He wasn't home. I left a message on the machine that I couldn't do it. He paid for a dinner, Jesse, not a phone call. Yeah, but who else knows that? Nobody else knows that. The guy knows that. Yeah, but nobody else does. Nobody else thinks that. Everybody thinks it, Jesse. Everybody thinks you are an idiot. But I'm not, man. I'm not an idiot. I mean, it's like I was saying. You're in a fog. A frickin' fog. An idiot. Somebody who knocks up his daughter and makes her have the baby. Uh, wait a minute. What about you and your cats? What about them? What do you call that? With your cats? You never even saw my cats. I saw your cats. I saw them. Every time I came over to the condo, you had a different friggin' cat. Yeah, well... Most people don't. The guy who bid on the dinner with you doesn't. When he has to go on the road, he makes arrangements for somebody to take care of his cat till he comes back. I never heard of any of my cats, man. Yeah, you're just a sick frickin' jerk. Every time you have a road game, you take your cat to the pound. And I go back and get another cat when I get back to town. Right. Meanwhile, Jesse, the other cat is dead. He'd be dead anyway. I'm doing that cat a favor by giving him a home for a little while. A home for a little while? It's not my job to take care of cats, man. I play hockey. And when you're hurt, you're supposed to act like it? Well, that's not me. Well, exactly. Exactly why you're not getting any skate endorsement. Exactly why you're not getting any endorsements. So don't get all over my case about not getting it because I'm not doing my job. I didn't tell you my idea. What? Mike Flanagan drew one of the dollar signs on my cast. Who the hell is Mike Flanagan? The sports writer. The hockey writer. Yeah, so what? Uh, well, I thought we could call Carter at Channel 6 and do something jokey, maybe, about Mike Flanagan and everybody who drew a dollar sign on my cast. You know, kind of make a joke about the whole thing. Your cast came off the day before yesterday. I still have it. The pieces of it, I saved it. It's old news, Jesse. Hey, old news. I'm still hurt. Yeah, well, everybody knows it. Everybody is well aware of the fact that you haven't played in weeks. The Nordiques game was a killer game. Five weeks ago. Two assists in two periods. And you got knocked out a minute into the third. Before that, you played in exactly two games all season. You've played a grand total of eight games in the past 18 months. I've been hurt. I'll get better. I know. Here's my point. When you've got the kind of rep you've got, when people think you're tough, when people like you because you're tough, they want to see that toughness out on the ice. They don't want to see it on the sidelines. It doesn't translate. To skate commercials either. That's what you're saying. To any commercial. 
You know, I remember when I was 13 years old. Did I ever tell you this? Um, when I went off to hockey camp, Bobby Hull was the head of it, even though I never saw him. Anyway, the last day I'm there, I get the chicken pox. My face gets all nasty, you know, like it does, and I mean, I got it bad, really bad. My face was so puffed up that when I flew home from camp, I got off that plane at the airport, my parents walked right by me. They didn't even freaking recognize me. I couldn't believe it. I cried like a baby, like a freaking baby. <laughs> yeah, so what's your point? Well, I'm just thinking, maybe we could use that to, you know... Turn... to turn you into a nice guy? Yeah. You're gonna need something more than chicken pox to do that, Jesse. Blackout. Scene four. Spot trips up again on Roderick Shapeland. Eleven fifty. Blackout. Scene five. Spot comes up on B. Saint Jacques. She stands writing a letter. Dear Jesse, uh, Mr. Madrazo, I mean. By way of introduction, my name is Beatrice Saint Jacques. B for short. I don't know if you recall my name. I have written to you on several previous occasions, nine to be exact. I have never received a response from you. That is all right. That is perfectly all right. You are certainly not obligated to take time from your busy schedule to reply to what are essentially mere fan letters. And that's certainly been the nature of my correspondence with you until today. I recently had the opportunity to meet a Mr. Morris Sky. Mr. Sky, as you may or may not recall, was the winning bidder in the recent National Cancer Society telephone, which featured a dinner with you as its centerpiece. Since I missed the auction, I mean, I didn't even know about it until after the fact, I endeavored, you know, endeavored to um, contact Mr. Sky. To be perfectly honest, I wanted to make a deal with him. I wanted to buy the dinner with you from him. You see, I am very interested in meeting you, and I have been for some time now. When I contacted Mr. Sky, however, he told me something that I found somewhat disturbing. He explained that you had contacted him and that you had reneged on your promise to go out to dinner with him, and you weren't going to go out to dinner with him at all, uh, even though he was the winning bidder. You had gone back on your word in other words. May I ask why? Why did you do this? Why? No, that's not it. That's not it at all. It's got to be something, oh, something else, something um, more benevolent, benevolently persuasive. Um, all I want him to do is, okay. dear Mr. Madrazo, I am pleased to inform you that you have won a prize, first prize, in our contest for professional athletes. Uh, that awards the deserving professional athletes cash prizes. To collect your prize money of $1,000, no. Uh, to collect your prize money of $5,000, please contract Beatrice St. Jacques, fee for short, and... No. No, 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 no. It's got to be something. Something. Else. Okay. Um... Dear Mr. Madrazo, my name is Theodore Rasmussen. Dr. Theodore Rasmussen. I am a doctor, a medical doctor, specializing in brain disorders, in cranial cancer in particular. I wish to alert you to a particular case that has come to my attention. She is a woman, a young woman, a very attractive young woman named Beatrice St. Jacques B for short. <laughs> um, Mr. Madrazo, she is dying of um, an inoperable, inoperable condition. Um, it's brain cancer, yes, brain cancer. 
are the most painful and heart-wrenching sort. It is difficult to say how much longer she will be with us. This is it from you. She is your biggest fan, would mean. Oh, God, no. Um, I've got it. Oh, oh, I've got it now. Dear Jesse, my name is Theodore St. Shock. I am 13 years old and I am your biggest fan. I watch you on TV every time you had a game. I had my mother, Theodore St. Shock, B for short, get cable just to watch you. My mother can't even take me to your hockey games because I am suffering. I am dying <laughs> of an operable brain cancer. That's why I was watching the National Cancer Society telephone last month, and I tried to make a bid for the dinner with Jesse Madrazo that you offered. Unfortunately, I was outbid. I bid a hundred dollars. Um, Seventy-two dollars, which is all of my savings, but I was still outbid for it. I feel upset about this. That's why I'm writing to you now. You see, I don't have that much longer. The doctors and my mother, B. St. Jock, won't tell me how much longer I have, and I love them very much, and I know that they are doing what they think is best, and I have just months. No, um, I have weeks, days to live. I know that you have a very busy schedule, I know that I realize that, but my dream, my only dream, the last final wish of my life is to meet you. You are my favorite sports personality, you are my, you're my hero. I would rather spend time with you than with anybody. I would rather spend time with you than with my own mother. Be saved, Shaw. Blackout. Scene six. <clears throat> Spot comes up on Jesse on the telephone. No, no, Stephen, you're the idiot. No, 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 that's not the way it is. That's not the problem here, man. Yeah, well, that's easy for you to say. You're already driving a Beamer. You're already driving a chick magnet. You're driving a piece of crap Toyota. Yeah, no, I know. I admit that. I know that. I know we got to do something. You know, I just told you what I'm willing to do, man. It's not just a kid. It's not just another kid. It's a kid with cancer. He's about to cack. Well, okay, fine. Tell me what you've got that's better. Steven, you know, what I did just get through telling you. I don't do that. I won't do that. And no more shopping centers, either. Get a second stringer for that. Get somebody else to do that. I'm not going to lower myself, you know? The kid's letter? Yeah, it came in the mail last week. Hell no, I didn't write him back. I told you already, brain cancer. The kid's dying of brain cancer. Well, exactly. Exactly what I've been trying to tell you, man. And if we jump on this right now, we can get to the kid before he cacks, and... It's days or weeks. That's what the kid says in the letter. Well, because I'm... I'm his freaking hero. The kid says he loves me more than his freaking mother, man. Yeah, if you only knew, right? <laughs> You're so freaking funny, man. You're such a freaking comedian. Well, Steven, see, that's what I've been trying to tell you. That's what I've been saying. So why don't you start doing your job? Start doing your job and call up this kid's mother. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what you should do. Call this woman up, find out if the kid's still alive. If he's not, forget it figure something else out. We'll send flowers and figure something else out. But if the kid's still alive, then arrange something for next week, man. And we'll be done with it, okay? No, no, Stephen. Stephen, listen to me. Listen to me closely now. You're the idiot. Blackout. Scene seven. Spot comes up on Roderick Champlain. How much was it again? Eleven fifty. You break a 20? Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, hello. Hi. Yeah, it's 11.50. You had ham on wheat, uh, you know, extra mayo I've in. I've never seen you before. Uh, yeah, I'm new. You must usually work nights. Uh-huh. Go to school during the day? Yeah. You're in the 
eighth grade. Yeah, well, I mean. Well, what's eight times nine? Well, it it, it it doesn't say here. How old are you? Fourteen. What's your name? Roderick. What's your last name? Roderick Champlain. Roderick Champlain. I am pleased to meet you. I'm Beatrice Sagechalk. You can call me B. Okay. You want me to change that 20 now? Listen, Roderick, how about this? How about I gave you well, that's uh, uh, yeah. that'd be great. That's an eight dollars tip plus change. Yeah, I know. That's great. Thanks. I'll give it to you if you tell me what eight times nine is. Well, the thing is, I don't know. And yes. Ninety. One hundred. One hundred twenty-five. Seventy-two, Roderick. The correct answer. Seventy-two. Oh my God, you don't know your times tables, do you? Not really. Okay. Um, well, listen to me for a second, okay? Um, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, a little trick. Um, if you ever have to multiply numbers times nine, with single numbers times nine, you see the answer always adds up to nine. Okay. Like nine times eight is 72. You see, seven and two add up to nine. You see? Uh-huh. What would nine times two add up to? Nine and nine is... 18. Yes! That's right, because see, one and eight add up to nine, you see? You've got it! You know it already, you learned something today! Yeah. You know what, I'm still gonna give you the eight dollars change tip. Thanks. You can call me B, Roderick. Uh, thanks, B. Uh, let, let me ask you one more thing before you go. Um, I, I know you have some other uh, yeah. Um, you don't go to school. Do you? Well, yeah. Sometimes. sometimes. Sometimes you go or sometimes you don't. Both. You don't go all the time. I'm not there now. You're working now. Making deliveries, yeah. Well, you have to work. Do you like to work? Not really. But, but you have to. See, you have to work. You're poor. Look, I, I uh, don't... Look, no, no. You're, see, you're poor. There's no shame in that. I mean, everybody has to start somewhere. Everybody's poor at some time in their lives. I don't have any money right now, isn't that right? Well, I... You know, it's illegal not to go to school when you're 14. I go to school. But you don't go every day, you're not there now. So call the cops on me, lady. You admit you're playing hooky? Yeah, sure. Have you ever played hockey? Huh? Have you ever played hockey, the sport, the hockey? I played street hockey. Not ice hockey. No. But you know the rules, the basic rules of ice hockey? Look, I've got... Yeah, 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 you have to go, I know, I know, I know. How about if I get you another Jumanji? Uh, another? Or another five minutes. I will give you $20 for another five minutes. Five minutes of... Oh, God, talking. All, all I want to do is talk to you, Roderick. About what? Hockey. Ice hockey. You want to give me $20 to talk about ice hockey? Five minutes. Because you should pay your time. Your time is invaluable. Your time isn't valuable? Mine is, mine is, but... Oh, okay. sure. what, what are you, a reporter or something? You don't know what I do. No. You didn't see the sign on the door when you came in? There was no sign on the door. There wasn't a sign on the door? You're sure about that? Yeah, there was just the buzzer with the number next to it. That's right, you're right, there is no sign! Okay, you see, I'm a doctor, actually, um, a psychiatrist. Do you know what a psychiatrist does? Yeah, you're a mind doctor. A mind doctor, that's right, that's what I do. You want to play games on my mind for five minutes? No. Okay, I want to give you money. You said you needed money. I never said I needed money. You said you needed to work. I do, but I don't need money. Okay, um, you could use extra money. Everybody could use extra money, yeah, Roderick. everybody could. You could talk about ice hockey to anybody. I see. So you, you want to know why I'm picking you. Well, yeah. Uh, what makes you so special? Is that it? Yeah, right. Well, let me tell you something, Roderick. Perfect for what? For a project that I'm doing. But listen to me a second. I know you've got other deliveries to make, but you know, just listen to me for like a second. Let me explain this. You see, you can help me. In turn, I can help you find balance. Gene, 
balance you and I, and when you stop and think about it, it's probably the only way for two people in our particular socioeconomic situations to do so. Achieve balance. You never answered my question. What question? About hockey, about ice hockey. You know the rules, you know the basic rules. Well, yeah, of course But you I definitely do. can help me, and I will give you $500 to help me. Five bills? Are you serious? Oh, of course I'm serious. I am dead. To do what now? Tell me with this project I'm working on. You know that I was talking about, which would involve a little acting on your part. Acting? You mean like making a movie? Not exactly. You want me to act like a hockey player? Oh, no, that's not it. That is not it at all. Okay, let me explain this a little bit more. Do you know who Jesse Madrazo is? No. Jesse Madrazo, the hockey player? No. The professional hockey player? You've never seen him on TV? No. You don't have cable? I don't have TV. Oh. Well, um, Jesse Madrazo plays hockey. Take my word for it. He's the most beautiful person I've ever seen in my life. You see, I love him. Uh-huh. His agent just called me. That's who I was talking to just now when I buzzed you in. Okay. You see, I wrote to Jesse Madrazo about a month ago about my son, uh, even though I don't actually have a son. I've never actually met Jesse, you see. I want to meet him so badly. Meeting him is the only thing I want in the whole world, in fact. So I did something a little unusual. I did something a little creative in order to meet him. I told him I have a son who's dying of cancer. Oh, that's me. That's you, exactly. You are my son, Theodore, if you want the job. I have to act like I'm dying of cancer. You have to act like you are Jesse Madrazo's biggest fan. You have to act like meeting him is the only thing that you want in the world. For how long do I have to do this? One day. One morning or an afternoon, uh, just so I'm able to meet Jesse. I am only doing this as a means to meet him, you see. So what do you think? Maybe five bills won't be enough. What? What was that rule for numbers times nine? Maybe oh. five times nine bills would work better. Maybe five Roderick. bills times nine. But what was that rule for numbers Roderick. times nine? What, what's five times nine, lady? Listen to me. What's the answer? Look, you are not I know, I'm out of here in five seconds flat if you don't tell me what the answer is. Oh, okay! Five times nine is forty-five! Because four and five add up to nine, or something like that. Right? And, and, five, and five bills times nine adds up to be 4,500, right? Roderick. Or we can call it even. And even 5,000. I mean, if I'm so perfect like you should say, I should be getting 5,000, right? You want to be just like your father, don't you? What? Oh, yeah. You want to be just like your father. You want to be just like your father. You don't know my father. Not entirely true. I've known him for 10 or 15 minutes now. You are the son of your father, aren't you? I know him through you. Your father is clearly someone who drives a hard bargain. Your father is clearly someone who's a conniver. And you want to be just. I don't want to be anything like my father. Well, then your father's greatest fault was that he drove a hard bargain. Your, your father's greatest flaw was that he was a conniver. It must have been. What are you talking about? You just said you don't want to be anything like your father. But if you are male, and if you don't wish to be anything like your father, if you deliberately try to be everything that your father is and or wasn't, then you will be different than your father. You will succeed in being different from your father, with one exception. You will possess your father's greatest flaw and possess it unshakably. You're crazy, lady. You're crazy if you think I'm gonna get you five thousand dollars. You can't afford five grand. I can afford it. I mean, I can afford it. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not the point. The point is, I made you a perfectly respectable proposition, and now you're taking advantage of it. Not really. No, see, you are. You're taking advantage of me, Robert. Not really. You just need me more than I need you. That is not true. I am offering you money, a lot of money. I don't need money. You need money desperately. You are ditching school to deliver sandwiches. You're probably living in a one-bedroom apartment with 12 brothers and sisters. This is a one-bedroom apartment. This is a one-bedroom condo. Condo apartment, my doctor, I don't care. I don't care what you say. I want five grand. I am saying that is unreasonable. 
I'm walking then, but thanks for the eight bucks. Stop, stop! You change your mind? Okay, now look. Does that mean yes? With certain qualifications, yes. What's that mean? Well, for five thousand, I think I should get a little bit more out of you. Like what? Like a guarantee that you are going to make this happen. Make him fall in love with you, you mean? Make him fall in love with me to the precise degree that I love him. How am I going to make sure of that? Well, that is not for me to say. It's not my problem, really. I'm not going to be the one lying flat in that hospital bed. That hospital bed. <sighs> Talking to Jesse about how heroic he is and how handsome he is. And I mean, I'm not going to get to, I mean, I'm going to tell him that I'm alone with him, but you know, you're going to be there first. You're going to be alone with Jesse first, and you're the one he's coming to see after all. I mean, you're dying of cancer, not me. I'm not the center of attention. Well, you know, at least not first. What if he doesn't even like you, though? Or, or what if you don't like him? I don't like him. I already love him. You've never even met him. I have seen him. You love him from seeing him on TV. People fall in love at first sight all the time. People fall in love with people they have never seen. They read about somebody, they fall in love with them. People read about rhinos, they fall in love with rhinos, they give money to save rhinos in Africa, and they have never even seen a rhino. They've never even been to Africa. They have never even been to a zoo, and yet they write a check, and they put a stamp on the envelope, even though the envelope doesn't need a stamp, and then they stuff the envelope in the mailbox, and they give their money, you see, and they don't have to see them to love them. They give thousands because they love them. And you're going to give me 5,000 because to make him love you. To the precise degree that I love him, that's right. What if he doesn't love you? He will. But what if he doesn't? What if he doesn't even like you? He'll love me. What if he doesn't, though? You don't have to worry about that part of it. He will love me. What you have to worry about is the degree. The degree to which he grants me emotional weight. If it doesn't balance, if we don't balance, you don't get the 5,000. It's that simple. But what if he doesn't even like you? What you, do I get out of it? You do not have to worry about that. I told you. But what if he doesn't he even will. like you? He will love me. But what if he doesn't? He will. But what if he doesn't? He will. But what if he doesn't? He will. Black Cat, end of scene seven. End of scene seven. Black Cat, end of Setting is a hospital bed, dominated by a huge hospital bed. At Rise, we find Roderick dressed in pajamas and with a bandage around his head, an IV in his arm, medical machines. He lies comfortably in the bed, bored. He makes the bed move up and down this way. Suddenly, Beatrice enters carrying a ragged hockey shirt with the number 36 on it. Hey, and how are we feeling this morning? Okay. Okay? We're feeling okay? We're not feeling okay. We're feeling <laughs> sick. I didn't know we were starting already. Right. You're in the bed, aren't you? Well, yeah. What did I tell you? What did we talk about? What are we talking about when? When I left? You said you're going to pick up that shirt. This is not a shirt. This is a jersey. A hockey jersey. I have washed this jersey 17 times to get it looking like this. It's mine, right? Of course it's yours. You wore it every day before you got sick, remember? You even wrote your name right here on the inside column. You remember your name, don't you, Jeff? Timothy? Oh my god, no! Not Timothy! It's not Timothy, that is not your name! How many times do we have to go through this? Your name is Theodore. Oh, right, right. Theodore what? Your name is Theodore what? Saint... Pierre? No, Saint Jacques! Theodore Saint Jacques! My name is B. Saint Jacques! You are my son and you don't even have, you don't even have your name memorized! I... Forgot. What if I forgot something? What if I forgot to arrange for this room? What if I forgot to call in a few favors to arrange for this hospital room? Well, then I guess we wouldn't be here, and uh, neither would that shirt. It's not a shirt, Theodore. <laughs> you know, do you want to do this or not? Wear that shirt, you mean? You wear a shirt. Me sign check. You don't want the $5,000. That is perfectly fine with me. Well, I... Shh, we spent hours going over this. But if you want to just forget it, if you just want to flush it all down the toilet, that is perfectly fine. That is perfectly fine with me, and you don't have to lie there, and I don't have to sign your check. Shh, don't get up! Well, 
You just said it. No, no, no. You are sick. You are sick. Very, very, very sick. Well, you know what? Getting this sign will make me feel lots better. Yeah, well. You're going to sign it. Of course I'm going to sign it. That's our agreement. You're going to sign it right now. No, I'm not. I'm signing it when he gets here. That was the agreement. After he gets here. You're signing it right now. No, Theodore. My name's not Theodore. It's Roderick. Roderick's of champagne. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Not while you're in that bed. It's not. Well, I'm getting out of this bed. No! Get me out of it. Call me, call me B. Um, that, that's Theodore, my son, uh, behind the screen. He's very excited. I can see that. Um, you, you don't have any idea what this means to him. You told me on the phone. I mean, right? meeting Jesse is the only thing Theodore wants in the world. I mean, I can't thank you enough for arranging all this. Yeah, well, it's it's not anything. Where is that... he? Ooh, where's Jesse? Uh, where's Jesse? Well, I told him 10 o'clock, but I'm not going to lie to you, lady. To Jesse, it's 10.30 at the earliest. Okay. I didn't tell the press 9.30, though. They at least should have been here by now. They're late. They're late. Right. Right. I guess they'll get here when they get here. I just, I have to say, since we have a minute here, I just want to tell you, it's, it's such a shame about your son. It's such a, it's such a friggin' shame. I mean, he looks like a, ter a terrific kid. I mean, he's not yeah. terrific, Mr. Carl. He's everything. Well, sure he is. I mean, he means everything to me. I don't expect you to understand that. I mean, after all, you're male. Well, I... I can, no, you are. You're male. There's no way for you to possibly understand that. Well, I know. No, you don't. You cannot know. You can't possibly know the love that I feel for him. Don't stop me. I know you may have heard about a woman speaking of her love for someone before, but don't stop me. I want you to listen. And when I say that loving him has become my entire life, my entire focus, my emotional weight in its entirety, it has, it truly has. When I first saw him last February 27th, 10 months, three weeks, and six days ago, I felt something inside me change. That was the first time I knew of him. That was the first time I felt him. That was the first and only instance in my entire life when I felt the true power of love within me. It's the day you found out, huh? That's when I first saw him. God, it must have been terrible. Oh, Just terrible. God, it was wonderful. Well, yeah, I, oh, okay, yeah, in a way, yeah, to uh, to realize that it's all such a crapshoot. Oh, God, such it was the happiest day of my life. It was what? It was the happiest day of my life! It was the happiest day of your life? Until today. The day you found out your son had cancer was the happiest day of your life. Well, um, no, not that day. Um, of course, not that day. I thought that was the day we were talking about. Why would I be happy about my son getting cancer? Well, yeah, exactly. Would you be happy? Well, no. I mean, I, I wouldn't, obviously. Who would? Nobody would. But nobody would. That's right. There's nobody in the world who would be happy about a kid having cancer. A, a terrific kid like that, especially with his whole life ahead of him. Uh, there's not one person in the whole world who'd be happy about that. Where is everybody? <gasps> They're late. Well, where's Mike Flanagan? How are we going to do this without uh, him? Jesse, uh, before you, uh, this is uh, Beatrice St. John. Call me B, Jesse, call me B. You're Thaddeus' mother. Theodore, Jesse. Theodore. Oh, Theodore's yes. mother. That's right. Uh, Theodore's back behind that screen. Uh, that's right. 
Well, how's he doing? How's my biggest fan doing? He's very sick. I'm feeling great. How are you? Well, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just doing my part. Playing my part. Right, Stephen? Jesse, don't you have something that you want to... Oh, right, right, right. Um, I have to tell you, B, right up front, I think you know it's really a shame. Really, really a shame about your son. I mean, he's so young. Twelve, right? Thirteen, actually. Right, right, thirteen. And such a, such a hockey fan with his whole life ahead of him and everything. Oh, thank you so much, Jesse. I mean, the children, you know, there are, there are, are... Future. Future, right. <laughs> and it's realized, it's realized Theodore won't really be a part of it. You do not know what this means to me, Jesse. I mean, to hear this from you. I just want you to know if there's anything Stephen or I can... Um, can I have five minutes with you alone? Well, I mean, should... Should anybody really talk to anybody here if Mike, Jesse, well, I mean, if Mike Flanagan and everybody else aren't here, no offense, but I don't know if anybody should talk to anybody. Jesse, you remember what we talked about. Well, yeah, sure, I remember. About while we're here, about what we're all doing here. I remember. I remember. Mike Flanagan isn't the reason we're all here today. Uh, Theodore good. is. Why don't we all go introduce ourselves to uh, Theodore right now? Why don't we all go talk to him and, and cheer him up a little bit before everybody gets here, okay? I mean, that's the real reason we're all here now, isn't it? It's one of them. All right, then. All right, let's, let's go meet Theodore. Hi. Hey, Theodore. How are we doing this morning? Okay. <laughs> I mean, sick. He's very sick, Jesse. If this doctor were here, I would introduce you to her and she could tell you just how sick. Her name's Dr. Jessica Smite. Um, I don't know why I bother mentioning her, actually. I mean, she's not here at the hospital today or anything. Um, she's not a particularly attractive woman. Um, but she could tell you about it, I mean, all about it. It's a terrible thing, a terrible tragedy. I can't possibly imagine what it's like to sit here and go through what I go through every day, to sit here and watch my son's life just fade away. He's going to get better, though, aren't you, Theodore? Uh, yeah. What's that you're working on there? Uh, I was just... Uh... Looks like a check. No, it's just paper. It looks like a piece of paper with clowns on it. Yeah, but these aren't the clowns on checks. These are different clowns. Theodore wears that hockey jersey all the time. I mean, Jesse practically seven days a week. He goes through one every couple of months. I practically have to tear them off of him. Otherwise, they'd never get washed. I have to wash them constantly. I must have washed that one 17 times. I mean, you can see how worn it is, can't you? Well, sure, sure I can. <laughs> You watch me every game, huh? Yeah, oh yeah, I do. I guess you really are my biggest fan. Yeah, I am. Well, that's good. That doesn't hurt. Not like it hurts to be in here, anyway. Yeah. I know what it's like to be stuck in a hospital bed. I've been there too, you know. I've been there recently. You've been sick? I've been hurt. That's why I haven't been playing anymore. I thought you watched me every game. Oh, I do, I do. I, I never miss. You saw the Penguins game. Uh, we both saw the Penguins game, Jesse. Yeah, 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 you played great. I didn't play in that game. Oh, right, uh, right. See, that's right, you were hurt, Jesse. Theodore forgot you were hurt on the bench. Yeah, yeah, you weren't even on TV. No, I was on TV. I was. They put the camera right on me, man. Don't you remember? Oh, yeah, yeah. Jesse, I... uh, oh, God, I have to apologize. It's the cancer talking. I No, I, I remember. I remember. I do. <laughs> you remember how they put the camera on me? When I was sitting on the bench? Well, yeah, sure. what I do? Well, you... you smiled. That's right. That's right, I smiled. Right after I... After you... didn't smile? No, it wasn't only that. It wasn't just that. I, I, I can't believe you don't remember this. I remember it, Jesse. Uh, yeah, but he's my biggest fan. Supposedly my biggest fan. I smiled and I... I smiled and I... You really don't remember this? 
Narcolepsy is one of its cooler <laughs> side effects. She's narcoleptic because of the cancer. Yes. Isn't it terrible? It's <laughs> terribly weird. I'll tell you what's weirder. He doesn't remember anything, Jesse. I mean, no offense, but he's supposedly my biggest fan. My biggest fan in the world. He doesn't remember a dang thing about me. Jesse, come on. It's called having brain cancer, Jesse. Yeah, come on. He's sick. He's in a fog. He doesn't remember the dollar signs on my cast. But he doesn't need yeah, to. Yeah, this isn't a problem, Jesse. Don't make this into a problem. I'm not making anything into a problem. I just see the detail, Stephen. What's that? What's the detail? Mike Flanagan and everybody else. What do you think's going to happen when they get here? Everything's going to work like we said it's going to work. That's what's going to happen. Not when they start asking him questions. Not when Mike Flanagan starts asking him questions. Fog boy, he doesn't remember anything. I, I can help, Jesse. I mean, I don't mind helping out. You see, I know everything about you, too. In fact, I know it better. Yeah, Jesse, this isn't a problem. It's going to work just like we talked about. Exactly like we talked about. They set up the cameras. V goes over and wakes up Theodore. And you take the stick over to him. He grabs a hold of the stick. You smile. He smiles back. And then, when the TV guys make the sign, you reach over and sign the friggin' stick with a magic marker. To Theodore. My biggest fan, signed Jesse Madrazo. Right. Just like we practiced. Just like we practiced, exactly. See, we don't have a problem. There's no problem here, everything's all set. <laughs> How about a little coffee while we're waiting? Yes, thank you, straight decaf. Sure thing, black sweet and low? Yeah, okay. All right then, all right, back in a flash. No, we probably don't remember the Islanders game last February 27th. February 27th? Last year? Well, it was almost a year ago. I wouldn't remember it either. Uh, I never watched a hockey game in my life before that day, but one of my patients gave me a videotape that afternoon, which I promised I would watch. It was an X-rated videotape. Uh, the patient in question, a former patient, uh, wanted me to watch the tape and give him my professional opinion as a psychiatrist as to whether or not he was sick for watching it as often as he did. It seems he watched this one-hour pornographic tape like five to ten times a day. Well, what was the tape all about? Oh, I, I don't know. I never watched it. Uh, because when I turned on my TV to prepare to watch the tape, there you were. The Islanders game. Highlights from the Islanders game. That's the first thing I saw when I turned on the TV. It was a close shot of you on the 11 o'clock news, skating across the blue line. It was the most transcendent moment I, mean, I have ever had in my life. It was a killer game, yeah. I immediately left the house, drove to an all-night newsstand, and purchased every available hockey magazine and sports publication that mentioned you. Oh yeah, that's great. How many were there? Two. <laughs> One of which had a full page a color photograph of you. I think I know the shot. You were waving to the crowd, like kicking your leg up. Yeah, I know the shot. The Kings game. A couple of years ago. I almost got a hat trick that game. You scored two goals and assist, according to the caption. Yeah, well, right. That's what I said. Almost a hat trick. It is a mesmerizingly beautiful photograph. Yeah, sure. You're punishingly desirable. Yeah, right, right, right. Theodore must love it, right? Theodore doesn't have anything to do with it. We just did his turn, Jesse. This is my turn now to tell you what, what I'm trying to get to is that, see, we have a lot in common, you and I. We have the world in common. Yeah, well... Man. No, no, see, we do. Please, don't mock me. Don't deny this destiny. I know you may have had other romantic relationships before. You may be in a romantic relationship right now, for all I know, but that doesn't matter. It won't matter once you hear me present my case to you. Case? 
I'm what trying, are you? I, I am trying to present my case to you, Jesse. I'm trying to show you how right you are for me in a romantic sense, in an emotional sense. I am trying to get you to balance with me! Balance? You want to get on a scale? Actually, in a metaphorical sense, yes, that's precisely what I want to have happen. Metaphorically speaking, of course, I'm on the scale already. Lying on the scale, waiting for you. What the heck are you talking about? I am talking about us, Jesse. You and me. Hey, we never even met before. Before today, we hadn't. That's right. You didn't know I was alive. You'll want to know all about my background, obviously, my credentials, as it were, before we begin. begin um, uh, Perry Meridian, Smith, Cornell, Columbia, prep school, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, one, two, three, four. Five is you're a little nuts. I am not nuts, Jesse. I am a psychiatrist. I say whether other people are nuts. Well, now there's a crop of crap. Jesse, no, don't, don't do this. I know that this is a lot for you to take in. It's a lot for you to understand all at once. I mean, I realize that if you would just take five minutes, 60 seconds, and just listen to me present my case, you might understand the gravity of what I am telling you. I'm listening, lady. It's just, you're talking crap. Be, Jesse, please, not lady. Actually, what I'm telling you makes perfect sense. And I've got the research to prove it. Research? After I saw you that night on the news, I did a couple of things. In order to learn more about you, in order to help my heart to determine absolutely that it's it. Well, I got cable, of course. That's the first thing I did. So that I could watch you every game. Second, I obtained a copy of the team's media guide. I mean, that helped me a great deal. That helped me get as close to you as I did. Although for a variety of reasons, I was never able to actually meet you. Third, you were supposed to be at Chuck Callahan board July 4th, according to the team's press office. I don't remember that. That's because you weren't there. You were a no-show. Had something better to do, I guess. You had something better to do this past fall, too, when you couldn't go to dinner with Morris Sky. Who? The winning bidder in the National Cancer Society telethon. Oh, right, right. You reneged on your promise to go to dinner with him. Why did you do that? How the hell do you know about it? I called him up because I didn't know about the auction until after the fact because I wanted the dinner for myself. For Theodore? No, not for Theodore. We just forget Theodore already. Theodore is the reason I'm here. Theodore is not the reason you're here. The reason you're here is because you and I were meant for each other. You and I have the world in common, Jesse. We don't have anything in common except for your son. We have everything in common, and this isn't about him. Okay, you were sold three years ago by the Canadians to the Flames for $200,000. Yeah? So? I was sold, too, for almost the exact same price. I mean, you can imagine what went through my mind, what went through my heart, when I came across this bit of information in Sports Illustrated. What? It was in Sports Illustrated, Jesse, in a preview of the coming hockey season three years ago. Don't you remember? Hey, wait a minute. I don't okay, think... You do not understand. I know. Okay, let me just explain this a little bit more. Okay, you see, I was sold too, just like you, for $225,000. My father bought me from my mother. I mean, I was nine and a half at the time. My parents were in the process of obtaining a divorce. They found they weren't right for each other. They found they couldn't achieve balance with each other. So you were sold? Yes, to my father. That's right, that's right. Okay, my father had a lot of money. He worked. My mother didn't have any money. She didn't work, but she had me. And your old man wanted you. He wanted me was willing to pay for me. The exact fee was a source of considerable negotiation. According to the documents I obtained when I turned 21, my mother originally asked for half a million dollars for me. That was the Canadian's opening offer. See, you see, you see, you see the connection between us? What the heck? What kind of connection is that? Oh, Jesse, I know exactly what you're saying. I know what you are implying. But the $25,000 disparity between the prices you and I ultimately commanded isn't nearly as significant as what you think. I don't think it's significant I at all. I don't either! I'm so glad we agree! I completely agree with you! Your celebrity status has 
to get factored into the equation, which I don't have. Your celebrity status has to be worth like about twenty-nine thousand dollars. What are you talking about? Endorsements? Endorsements? Yes, th that's right. They've been worth at least twenty-five thousand dollars, right? Well. Oh my God! They've been worth more. I knew it. I just knew it. Actually, they're. I am not surprised. I am not a bit surprised, Jesse. Hey, what have you been endorsing lately? Well. Stuff, you know? Lots of stuff. But what have you been endorsing lately? Because I have not seen your face on hey, any. Maybe that's none of your business. You ever think about that? But it is my business, Jesse, because you and I are meant, meant to... for each other. Right, right, right. Here we go again. We're meant to be together, you know? Because there's this connection between us. We were both sold for around a Port of mill, I was in a trance, crossing the blue line on the 11 o'clock news. Am I forgetting anything? Oh my god! I am so glad you finally understand! I don't understand a dang thing! I don't know what the heck you're talking about! Yes, you do! You just think you don't! I've already got the room. Room? Across the street. We can go there right now. What? You... It's the hospitality suite. No, it's a hotel room. Hey, you know, this was only supposed to take an hour or two. We, we, don't, we don't have to spend the night there. We? The room's for us, Jesse. For you and I. You know, so we can get to know each other better. You want to sleep with me? If you'd like. I mean, that would be wonderful. A wonderful place to start. I mean, one never truly knows whether they have the full attention of someone else's soul. I mean, someone may say that they love you with all their heart, but you can't know that. Absolutely. It's impossible to know. That is an absolute certainty. I mean, obviously, even if it's your boyfriend, even if it's like your father, because it can't be measured in a tangible way. Uh, but when you're engaged in sexual intercourse with someone, You've got the full attention of their bodies. Their bodies cannot be anywhere else. Their physical attention can be focused completely and indisputably on you. See, you see, this is why people who love each other, I mean, people who say they love each other, have sexual intercourse so often, because the physical is tangible, because the physical is measurable empirically. This is why sexual intercourse is so powerful. This is why sexual intercourse remains the weighty means of balance. I've already put the condoms in the room. Well, I mean, okay then. What the heck? Wonderful! I will see you there in five minutes. Yeah, yeah, sure, okay. What the hell was that? She got us a room across the street. She got you a room across the street? Their son dying of cancer? Have to do something while we're waiting on these guys. <laughs> got a little piece of news for you. They're not coming. They're... I just got off the phone with Mike Flanagan. He says she called him this morning and called the whole friggin' thing off. <sighs> she <laughs> called off what? This. The press conference, the whole you meeting the kid. But... If she... That's why nobody's here. She called everybody, except you and me, and told them it wasn't happening. But, but why would she... I'll explain it to you, schmuck. Because she wants you to go across the street. It's the whole reason we're here today. It's be the only reason we're here today. What the hell is going on here? What do you mean? What are you doing? What's your mother doing? Well, she's... What are you doing? What the hell is this? It's a, a, a check. For what? Uh, five thousand dollars. No, for what? For what, man? Who the heck is... Roderick Champlain? Oh, just a friend. A doctor? No. Why the hell she's writing a check to Roderick Champlain? Because she thinks he needs money. He needs money? No, no, he doesn't need money. Well, then why is she writing him a check? What the heck are you doing with it? Well, because he's... Well, see, he's... He's... He's me.
said she'd give me five thousand dollars to act like I have cancer and to act like you're, I'm your biggest fan. You're not my biggest fan. I don't even know who you are. You don't know who I am. You don't have cable. I don't have TV. Oh wait, wait a minute. Whoa. whoa, whoa. <laughs> you don't have cancer. That's right. You don't have cancer. What the heck are you doing in here? Pretending I do, so she could meet you, but she did. Oh, come on, Jesse, we are out of here. Well, wait up. Come on, it's a wash. Hold on a sec. It's a wash. The whole freaking thing's a wash of a morning. Jeez. So you were just wearing that shirt to... Pretend I was your biggest fan, yeah. 36 is your number? Yeah. Hey, 3 and 6 add up to 9. That means it's an answer to something. With single numbers times nine, the answer always adds up to nine. That's what she says, anyway. Yeah, right. She says you have cancer, too. <laughs> what did you tell him? That you do not have cancer? Huh? He was supposed to come over to the hotel. I know. You made him drive away. You made me chase his car two whole blocks. I didn't make anybody do anything. You have the key. It's right there. Yeah? So you told him something. You must have told him something. I told him the truth. The truth about what? About you. That's not the truth. I mean, that is not the bigger truth. The bigger truth is that I love him. No, you don't. What? You don't love him. Yes, I do! No, you don't love anybody. Yes, I do! I don't love anybody! What the hell do you know about it? Lots more than you. You are 13 years old! I'm 14. You deliver sandwiches for minimum wage! Plus tips, yeah. You don't know anything about it! Well, I... You do not know anything about anything! Well, that's not, that's not... You don't know what you just did! You do not know how many sandwiches it takes to make $5,000! I'm not saying that... You could have had $5,000! You could have made $5,000 just now! Well, yeah, but... With one hour's work! $5,000! That is what you would have gotten just now! But you would have gotten And I, anything. I would have gotten Jesse! For an hour, maybe. No! Not for an hour, forever, forever! You don't believe it. Oh, God, I do believe it! It would have happened! It almost happened! If you hadn't done this, if you hadn't ruined everything at the moment, it was happening! Well, that's the whole idea! Oh, my God, that's what you wanted to have happen? Well, that's right. You wanted to ruin everything? Yes. I thought you wanted money! I never wanted the money, not really. I don't need money, I told you that. What do you need? My family, just my family. Your father? Not my father. My mother and my brother and my sister. That's all you need. Why did you do this? Why the hell did you go through all this? So you could learn. So I could learn what? How to love someone. I already know how to love someone! I love Jesse! It's not love, baby. It is love, it is! I think about him all the time! Don't you understand? He's all I ever think about! All I ever think about! What the hell do you know about this? What the hell are you doing? That's why are you doing this? Why I told you to it? make you learn! I am not learning anything! You're just not teaching me anything! You're just hurting me! That's the only way to learn. And I've already been hurt. I've already been hurt. Don't you understand? Years ago. But you didn't learn then. Oh, I didn't. You didn't learn then because you didn't feel the hurt then. But I did feel it. No, you didn't. I you couldn't have. You must have just ignored it. You have to feel the hurt before you can learn from it, lady. You have to let yourself feel it before you can learn from it. I'm giving you another chance. I helped this happen. I helped us along as far as I could because I knew how it turned out. I knew it would hurt you. And the further it went, the, fur the further along it went, 
the more it hurts you. I knew you had a chance to feel the hurt if you wanted to, so you could learn from it this time if you wanted to. Like I learned. Thank you very much.